They just missed my story from last week. <laughs> I see we are live now on YouTube. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good time to start the meeting. It is six o'clock. Uh, so we will start our Prescott Town Council meeting for Monday, October 19th, 2020. Uh, call the meeting to order and move right on to the approval of the agenda under item two. And that recommendation tonight, of course, is that the agenda of the council meeting of October 19th, 2020 be approved as presented. Do I have a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Young, seconded by Councilor McConnell. Any uh, discussion or comments on the agenda this evening? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carried. Thanks, everyone. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Anyone have a declaration uh, tonight? Seeing no, uh, four presentations, nothing this evening, five delegations, ditto. Uh, six minutes of the previous meetings, and uh, we've got a couple uh, oldies but goodies here under uh, uh, Committee of the Whole and Council tonight. 6.1 is Committee of the Whole Minutes. Uh, the recommendations at the Committee of the Whole Minutes dated March 2nd, 2020, be accepted as presented. Uh, could I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor Shankar. Uh, any discussion on that uh, set of minutes? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion carried. And under 6.2, we have minutes from uh, a few council meetings. Uh, Councilor McConnell, do you have a comment? Actually, that was a comment rather than a, a vote. I, I, as well as probably the people in the audience, are wondering why we're approving minutes from back in March. Uh, well, I'm sure our clerk has the answer for that. I think it's just the timing. Uh, Kimberly? <clears throat> Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit back in March, we immediately moved to uh, emergency special council meetings. Now that we're back in our normal council format, I brought forward the minutes that need approval this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so moving on to 6.2, uh, sort of the same thing here, uh, aside from the last one, uh, the recommendation under 6.2 council minutes is that the council minutes of February 26, 2020, and the special council minutes of March 16th, 2020, and October 5th, 2020 be accepted as presented. Uh, could I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Burton. Uh, any discussion on uh, those sets of minutes? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, so seven uh, communications and petitions, nothing this evening. Eight, uh, we are moving on. A, this is the first uh, agenda, is it not under the cons consent uh, consent format? Uh, Kimberly, just want to make a quick comment just for, so of all of council and also what people out there know what we're moving to, although there's not much under it this evening. Sure, through you, Mayor Todd, as per the recent amendments that we made to our procedural bylaw here at council, this will be a section on the agenda going forward where we can house um, typical information reports that may not generate a lot of discussion or questions always. It's just a quicker way to move through to the actual uh, agenda items on your council agenda. So every meeting you'll see the typical council information package. And then uh, going forward, you'll also see reports like Matthew's monthly financial report and Sean's quarterly building and bylaw information reports. If someone wanted to have something moved, from this section of the agenda. They could just do so when we approve the agenda at the beginning of the meeting and we can move it down to the report section for discussion. Thank you. Yeah, the only question I would have on that, we could actually go further with this. I mean, we've got two, uh, uh, two tenders on there uh, tonight that we're just approving. I mean, even that could go under, uh, under the consent agendas, could it not? You For know, you, Mr. Mayor, it, it could. We're, we're starting with just typical information reports and it, it just depends on how council wanted to move forward with this section of the agenda. Sure, just just for food for thought because that could speed hey. our meetings as well. Hey. Uh, so, anyways, hey. uh, so we do have under uh, under hey. eight tonight. Uh, the, the one uh, is just the uh, council information package. So the recommendation is that all items listed on the consent report section of the agenda be accepted as presented. Uh, could I have a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Shankar, seconded by Councilor Young. Uh, so 8.1 is the council information package distributed as always under separate cover. Uh, not much there uh, tonight, but are there anything that anyone would like to speak to or refer on to a future meeting? 
Seeing nothing this evening, so I'll call the question. All in favor? Motion is carried. So under uh, nine committee reports, uh, there have been no committee meetings, so nothing there. Uh, Ten mayor's portion of this evening. I have uh, nothing uh, uh, this evening. Uh, so we'll move on to 11 outside boards and cities and commissions. And, He's at uh, home. Go around the room. Uh, so as, as usual, if anyone has anything to report on. So uh, I think that I just lost a we in. Yes, I believe we may have. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Councillor McConnell then. Anything to report under 11 tonight, uh, Councillor? Uh, just that this week is uh, Libraries Week and we are celebrating down at the library. The library, as I mentioned during our last meeting, is open for regular hours now. That is uh, day and evening and on Saturday and people are more than welcome to come back to use the library and the computers. We do have a limited number of people that can access the library at one time, but so far that hasn't been any kind of a problem. Uh, I'm also on the board of Walker House and Susan has been very good with a column in the Prescott Journal, letting everyone know what is going on. Well, not necessarily at Walker House, um, but uh, that Walker House is looking after at, at other places in the community is sponsoring. Uh, as I'm sure we all know on council, there was a, an unfortunate flood at Walker House uh, a week or so ago. A pipe let go in the upstairs bathroom, flooded the downstairs kitchen, pretty much destroyed it. But um, work is ongoing there for restoration and uh, we'll have further updates as, as that uh, continues. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Thank you very much, Councillor McConnell. See, Councillor Burton's uh, back with us. So we'll go back to uh, to her under item 11 for outside boards, committees, and commissions. Thank you. Uh, nothing to report at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jansman. Uh, hi. Um, the BIA is still very active, and they, um, with the help, of course, of, right of Dana, um, the community improvement um, plan is um, is still very much part of the planning committee that uh, we're on. So, um, which only improves the BIA, of course. The digital um, marketing that the BIA um, initiated, um, um, the employee has been um, has been chosen and. Um, and that, of course, as you may recall, is being shared with the Township of Augusta and the Township of Edwardsburg Cardinal. So that's a very exciting um, thing that's, that's going to be happening um, starting soon for the next year. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jasmine. Uh, Councillor Ostrander, please. Mike, can you hear me? Mike, I don't think Mike can hear me. Uh, so, Councillor Ostrander. Guess not. Uh, Councillor Shankar, please. Um, I uh, honestly have nothing uh, to report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Councillor Young. Thank you, Mary Todd. I've attended both the uh, St. Lawrence Lodge and Board of Health um, meetings, but have nothing to report from them. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Young. One more try, Mike. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm not not sure if Mike's fully connected here. Uh, anyways, can someone send him an, an offline note or whatever just to see if he's uh, if, if he's connected uh, at all? Lindsay, Kimberly, please just see if he's. So I could hear him a moment ago when he was talking to B, and I can't. Nothing now, so okay. Hopefully, we'll get Mike back up uh, in, a, in a minute or two. Uh, so that's uh, through uh, uh, section 11. So thanks very much, everyone. Item 12 is staff. I uh, do have a few reports there this evening. 12.1 is staff report 70 2020 in the service delivery and operational review. Uh, we do have the draft report that was included in your uh, in your 
documentation this evening. I'll turn it over uh, to Mr. Armstrong and uh, Mr. Darby for their comments and uh, lead in to uh, discussion of the draft report. Gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Todd. So this evening is kind of a follow-up from uh, our last meeting from two weeks ago and just wanting to take a little bit closer look at the uh, recommendations and uh, perhaps providing some priority and understanding of what that might look like. So uh, that's kind of what we're, we're uh, aiming for this evening and I'll pass it over to Ted to uh, be able to walk us through that. Thank you. Hello everyone, can you hear me all right? Yep. Um, so I had a, a few technical difficulties. I'm uh, uh, broadcasting from the nation, which is a little northeast of you. Um, so I had a previous meeting here. So um, my apologies. I'm actually having to use a, another laptop than the one I normally use. So I don't actually have the presentation um, on this other laptop. So I, I don't know, Matt, if you can uh, help me with uh, um, putting the PowerPoint up on the screen. Absolutely. Just one more, please. Uh, so you may recall that uh, at our last meeting, I walked you through the methodology and uh, we did go through some of the, um, the corporate information. Um, and we talked about the survey results and uh, um, as well, there was an appendix in your original package that contained um, a lot of detail with respect to departments um, and uh, what they do and how they do it and benchmarks, et cetera. Um, from um, are we okay? <laughs> um, right, so uh, I've unmuted, I've done every kind of damn thing I can think of. The camera off, play it, it keeps rotating through the water. They're gonna. Okay, uh, are we okay to proceed? Yes, please. Okay, um, so uh, part of the process was uh, to gather up recommendations from the departments. So in the appendix where you have all that survey information, there's a, um, we asked uh, all managers, uh, supervisors and department heads that contributed to this um, to identify opportunities that they saw for uh, value improvement or collaboration or anything that could improve things. Um, so we, we harvested a lot of good information from that. Uh, we also had a planning day with the managers from Augusta so we met uh, together with the um, Augusta group and uh, worked in small groups um, with peers um, to talk about uh, what Augusta was doing and what Prescott's doing, where there are opportunities for collaboration, um, but also to do some peer review as well. Um, and then we've, um, I've, I've tried to bring in some best practice based on uh, what I know from other municipalities and other service reviews. Um, the CAO at Augusta, as well as uh, your CAO and I've had numerous uh, conversations as well. And, and what you have in um, the section that uh, Matt's got highlighted now on, on the screen, um, we've got a section of the report that's called uh, opportunities. So at this point, we're, we're not at a stage where we're formally making recommendations. What we're doing now is to try to identify uh, opportunities that have come up in the work done thus far. Uh, but a major part of tonight's conversation uh, is to engage you in the process and uh, um, see if there's anything um, that uh, uh, we've missed or that you would like to suggest as an opportunity. Uh, there may be some further work, some further investigation, um, but we're still at the investigative stage where we're trying to uh, pull out information uh, from all sources, including, I should add, um, the, the community survey. Uh, we try to pick up uh, opportunities from the community survey as well. Um, now, the slide that Matt has up at the moment um, is the introduction to the opportunity summary. Um, and what we try to do is organize the opportunities in a table format, um, but in four categories. So the first category is things that we believe could lead to cost savings and or improved service delivery. Um, the next one would be, uh, are there any uh, areas where we're over-serviced, where there could be service level reductions? 
Um, the third is, are there opportunities for collaboration? Um, and that would be shared services or purchase services um, that, that could be considered. And then the fourth option is, are there opportunities to generate revenue? So things like uh, in, uh, user fees that may not have been considered or increase in user fee or improve cost recovery methods. So that's uh, the basic format. And um, if we're okay so far, I will um, take you through each of the categories and review what we've got so far. So I'll just pause for a moment and see if there's any uh, questions or concerns. I just any want comments and questions for anyone so far? I, I do notice, I don't know if anyone else is having issues, but sharing the screen really slows everything down and seems to be causing some a little more audio artifacting. Is everyone okay with that? I mean, it's, it's listenable and watchable on this end, but it's, it's definitely causing some performance issues. Everyone okay? I just don't want to lose anyone. Because I've had problems all day, Brad, and they don't seem to be improving any. Okay. If anyone has any issues though, just please uh, speak up and we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop the screen sharing. I know that does take a significant, uh, a little bit of added bandwidth. If everything's okay, we'll keep we'll keep going. So, Ted, please. Okay, thank you. So, um, the first in the uh, in the first category um, is uh, uh, adopting a uh, strategic accountability framework. Um, now, this is really isn't anything new to you. It's basically reinforcing what you're already doing. Um, you uh, put together a strategic plan back in the spring, I understand, and uh, you are um, shortly going to be approving that. So that's awesome because that's critical to start with a, a, a good strategic plan. Um, and that allows you to then set up uh, annual objectives. So objectives on an annual basis that uh, tie in uh, uh, more specific goals um, uh, to, uh, that, 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 that are aligned to achieving your strategic plan. Um, and those specific annual objectives uh, then translate into departmental objectives and ultimately into individual uh, ob objectives that in theory should can be tied into actual performance evaluations. Uh, and what's critical is to tie that all together into uh, monitoring um, by council. Uh, and I believe that you do receive monitoring reports uh, that are prepared uh, on a regular basis by staff. Um, and that process is to be uh, obviously uh, encouraged. Um, and in so doing is you do that on a uh, annual or sorry, on a quarterly basis. And all of a sudden it all starts to tie together, uh, including a formal performance management system uh, that's tied to achievement of corporate goals. Um, and with all that, you align governance and management and you start achieving things on a, uh, uh, that, that lead you towards a, a realization of your, um, the vision that you've articulated in your uh, strategic plan. Now, I think I'm preaching to the choir with that, so, um, but let me just pause and see if that makes sense. Comments or questions for Mr. Darby? Oh, I think we're good so far, Ted, so please continue. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was trying to click the next slide, forgetting that uh, Matt's driving. Um, the next uh, uh, sort of high level uh, perspective is to use a project management framework as uh, uh, part of your reporting um, and, achieve, and, and, and the, the actual methodology by which you would achieve your uh, uh, corporate objectives. So essentially what that would mean is that your monitoring reports uh, include uh, what's the project, what's the schedule, who's the most responsible person, what's the budget, what's the forecast, what's the status. So when you um, take your strategic directions, you create your uh, annual objectives, um, you then start to develop uh, specific projects 
uh, to achieve those objectives and you adopt a project management approach that clearly is, uh, delineates what are, what's the schedule, who's responsible, uh, when it's going to be delivered, what resources are necessary. Um, and uh, all of that aligns with uh, our advice to make sure that you are uh, following a, a disciplined approach uh, to the achievement of the objectives that you set out annually uh, that tie into your strategic directions. And again, I suspect that this is all uh, that, that this is this reflects what you're uh, striving towards currently. Okay, Matt, uh, unless there's any questions. So one of, one of the general observations that I'd make in your organization is that, uh, I, I mean, Prescott is a small municipality. You have a relatively small staff. Uh, I believe, Matt, it's something in the range of 20 uh, uh, full-time staff. Would that be fair to say? Uh, approximately 27. 27, okay. Um, and your, your staff are largely consumed with doing um, very specific activities, such as, you know, the people that, that plow your roads, maintain your roads, that... Um, they're, they're task driven. Uh, what what I'm really trying to say is that in all this, there's there's not a lot of, of uh, room for uh, people to hide. People are very visible. Um, and bottom line is, is that in my view, you have a very efficient and effective organization. Um, but nonetheless, um, and there's some opportunities for fine tuning. And, and I think one of the um, the things that where there would be some benefit is to be very clear with respect to role descriptions. Um, in other words, your, your job descriptions uh, are quite precise. Um, and uh, that, that ties into uh, your strategic plan to your uh, um, And uh, you can also, by, by doing that role review, by looking at your job description, you can look for any potential duplication of services um, or where there might be opportunities to uh, perhaps realign and take advantage of um, uh, support staff uh, to serve um, perhaps some, some people that are uh, somewhat underserved. Um, you know, the, you look at your department heads and their requirements, is there some opportunity to share uh, support staff? So that's a general um, overview um, and I think, Matt, that, that I would hope that that aligns with work you already have underway or see as future work. So I would see this as happening over the next couple of months and uh, makes perfect sense in terms of building on what we've been trying to do over the last few years. And that will, um, in so doing, one of the things that you see is that, uh, is that your org chart, uh, the organization chart might shift a little bit. Um, as a result, um, I've not tried to uh, critique um, or suggest an alternative organization. I think that that's um, the, very much the CAO's role. And um, I think when you go through that process of looking at roles and, and carefully uh, going through the job description, um, the organization will naturally fall out. Okay. Um, there were a few suggestions in terms of some efficiencies that could be provided. So, for example, with the um, your uh, uh, truck, your roads department, um, the the fleet, um, you're cur currently relying on uh, out of house uh, private sector services. Um, that's there. There may be a business case to be made for uh, hiring an in house service, uh, an in house mechanic to do that work. So that's an opportunity for further study. Uh, next, um, your procurement, uh, I'm sorry, I meant, I, oh yes, there's the asset management plan coming up. Uh, sorry, um, your uh, procurement policy. Um, so I, one of the suggestions that I think is, or principle of good governance, an ongoing review of your, of, uh, your uh, council policies. Uh, and one of them would be, uh, or, or bylaws, I guess is the more appropriate term for the municipality. Um, but one of the, su the suggestions here is to uh, review your procurement policy, uh, specifically with respect to uh, frequency of tenders, 
to make sure that there's uh, ongoing um, periodic uh, retendering um, according to what council uh, feels is appropriate. Um, an asset management plan, I believe this is already on Matt's agenda. So, um, you know, that's something that uh, um, uh, should be done as part of your long range planning that will flow from your strategic plan. Please feel free to interrupt me um, as I go through this. Um, the uh, next slide is for um, is about doing uh, departmental master plans. So you already have a master plan in place. I understand it was done a few years ago for your parks and recreation department. Um, that's a, uh, uh, I think, I hope you found that to be a very worthwhile exercise. Um, but I believe there's also an opportunity for a number of uh, other areas within the organization, uh, including uh, water, wastewater uh, and distribution, um, a fire, um, fire department master plan. Um, and um, as time goes on, you'll want to do updates to uh, the parks plan. Um, these, these plans don't replace the asset management plan. They tie together, um, but allows you to again, align your strategic plan and the overall corporate objectives uh, with uh, specific uh, aspirations of, uh, at a departmental level. Uh, and certainly with some areas like water, wastewater, as well as with, for example, the fire service, um, uh, things are evolving very quickly. Um, and uh, there's, there's a, um, statutory as well as best practice uh, uh, concept that do deserve uh, in-depth study. Okay. Uh, collaboration. So you already have an excellent relationship with Augusta. And just as I was joining, I heard uh, a brief discussion about the economic, about economic development with uh, Edwardsburg Cardinal as well. So I think you're, you're doing a great job uh, on the collaboration front. Um, there's certainly uh, significant opportunities and staff uh, at our um, joint workshop I mentioned identified a number of key areas where um, the Augusta staff and the Prescott staff uh, saw an opportunity. Uh, one is to look at your uh, financial and asset management information systems, look at uh, development of records and documentation. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, working collaboratively can save a lot of time in policy development and uh, documentation, et cetera. Um, planning, there's already a good uh, relationship with uh, the planning and building uh, department. Um, that should continue to be supported. Uh, potential for integrated office applications and possibly even developing uh, your own GIS to, uh, um, that would work with uh, what the county is doing. Um, a number of strategic initiatives were identified uh, that where that I believe you've already you know that are already in place. Um, but again, to support those activities such as the 401 corridor development, uh, economic development, and you know talking about how you can extend servicing um, from you know Prescott to adjacent lands uh, that would be a mutual benefit. Unless there's any questions, we can move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, joint policy procedure development. So this is just a, an, a, an additional uh, comment um, that really suggests that all departments would benefit from um, uh, joint policy procedure, but specifically areas like HR and occupational health and safety. Um, a municipality with, with uh, small small number of staff um, often, uh, you know, the major HR issues or occupational health and safety issues can be infrequent, uh, but it's certainly important to focus on prevention uh, and making sure that you've got adequate uh, uh, appropriate policies in place and procedures so you, you, you avoid uh, potential HR occupational health and safety issues. Uh, sharing staff expertise. Uh, so a number of things are already in place, but there's probably some additional uh, opportunities. Um, for example, planning, you're using an external consultant as well as internal resources for uh, uh, minor uh, planning issues. Augusta has a full-time planner. You have a full-time economic development officer. Um, there's, uh, that would suggest that there's uh, probably some uh, opportunities to you know, work together collaboratively. 
Um, Parks and Rec, there's certainly some opportunities, for example, playground safety inspections, where Augusta, sorry, uh, Prescott may have resources to offer uh, Augusta. Uh, with the fire department, uh, volunteer fire departments in the province are facing uh, major challenges across the board in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with uh, uh, all the tasks that they're charged with, such as public education, inspection, uh, in addition to uh, uh, suppression activities, firefighting. Um, so, you know, the opportunity to share resources with training or public education, uh, fire inspection um, are, should be encouraged. Uh, you have a great relationship, as I understand it, with your two chiefs now. Um, so that's uh, well in hand, uh, those kind of collaborative relationships. But uh, just to highlight them um, as, as something that to be continue to be encouraged. Uh, procurement, uh, there's obviously economies of scale. Uh, when you can uh, joint purchase uh, items. So, you know, those are uh, ongoing opportunities that should be looked at. Um, one thing I'll, I should point out in terms of implementation on, on the right-hand side, you'll notice that column. And I've uh, identified or suggested a joint collaborative initiative task force. Uh, so you may already have something in place um, but just a suggestion that um, something be formalized uh, so that there's a, a tracking and activity on an ongoing basis uh, in terms of um, how you can work together. Um, a lot of these tasks would fall to management, uh, but from a governance perspective, council may be interested in um, having a joint committee with Augusta and possibly Edwards Burke Cardinal as well, uh, so that council can actively participate um, and monitor uh, collaborative efforts. Okay, uh, next slide. Matt, are you there? <laughs> yeah, it should be continuous improvement uh, process redesign. Oh, I, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Right, um, sorry about that. Right, so um, so in the departmental uh, uh, reports that were received, uh, there were a number of uh, activities that were identified that were uh, very specific um, to, the, um, uh, to the department. Um, I've not tried to uh, highlight all of the specific uh, projects that were identified, um, but suffice to say that there were a number and I believe that there's still more to be done. Um, and I would suggest that this should be an ongoing rolling process uh, where you identify um, opportunities for process improvement and you use uh, Lean or Six Sigma or Lean Six Sigma or other process excellence uh, tool uh, to continue to um, uh, seek out opportunities to improve processes. Um, there's uh, maybe some areas in finance where one could look, for example, at a detailed uh, examination of uh, workflow uh, for things like accounts payable or payroll, uh, where you do a really in-depth deep dive into the process and you look for specific opportunities to improve the process. Um, I'm also suggesting that, you, that the departments continue to do peer benchmarking um, that really what this means is that on an ongoing basis, what I'd suggest is that uh, you consider actually taking those departmental reports, um, this, the, the template, um, and actually incorporate it into your budget process. So every year you ask departments to identify potential process improvement opportunities um, and you make sure that departments are in fact pursuing at least one or two process improvement um, opportunities over the course of the year and that the results of that be uh, reported back and then new projects be set up uh, in the next uh, budget year. Uh, in addition, um, one would continue to report on benchmarks, uh, benchmark activities so that you're constantly looking at uh, other um, uh, other uh, peer groups uh, to consider whether or not there's uh, any um, uh, opportunities to pursue. And that would also give council uh, a sense that uh, you're constantly monitoring uh, how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis your peers. So 
in other words, the service delivery review shouldn't be a once in five years activity. What I'm suggesting is you actually try to build it into your ongoing processes and uh, in that way support a culture of continuous improvement. I know that's a lot of words, <laughs> but I hope it makes sense. Um, there's uh, an opportunity to uh, share emergency uh, management uh, uh, staff um, and uh, just on, in that same vein um, to look at your existing automatic and mutual aid agreements uh, to ensure optimal staffing for uh, both uh, Augusta and Prescott uh, fire departments. Um, again, one of the challenges that fire departments across the province are facing that is volunteers is, is staffing, particularly during the workday. And um, I know I can, there are some departments that are actively working with their neighbors uh, to ensure that they can maintain um, daytime coverage uh, by in fact, uh, basically automatically re having a, a, a two township uh, response uh, to daytime um, if staffing becomes an issue. So just another example. Okay, uh, moving right along. Revenue generation. Um, so a number of opportunities there. Uh, some are re somewhat redundant because obviously is with your economic development efforts, you're already encouraging new residential and commercial development. Uh, clearly that's a revenue opportunity um, in that it creates additional uh, tax base. Um, and there may in fact be some uh, business case uh, return on investment arguments that can be um, brought forward uh, to support uh, investment in um, uh, uh, economic development as a way to increase revenue. Um, another point is to ensure that you're um, taxing vacant and excess land uh, and you're not actually uh, incenting people to leave um, um, to leave uh, uh, dormant property uh, undeveloped. Um, and then an annual review of uh, your user fees um, based on peer group analysis, but to make sure that you're, uh, um, you're maximizing that uh, at the same time, recognizing that uh, uh, it is a competitive world and you don't want to uh, increase user fees beyond a point that uh, is acceptable. All right, next one. And that ends the what we have so far in terms of opportunities. But now what I'd like to do is, uh, is open it up for any questions or comments, um, but also to uh, make sure we're, we've brought, got your input into um, this and in short to ask what's missing. Thanks a lot, Ted. So I'll open it up. I see Councillor Jansman uh, has a comment already. I just want to remind everyone, though, as well, before we get uh, really heavily into this, uh, nothing's off the table, of course, tonight, but these are all opportunities. Nothing is carved in stone here, so we don't have to argue and, and discuss the uh, the actual options here. That's uh, for, for a later date, but if there's anything else anyone wants to include or or so on here that, uh, that uh, may have been missed, uh, please have at it. So with that, I'll open it up uh, and I see Councillor Jansman had her hand up first. So please, Teresa, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to comment really, uh, uh, thank you to um, the staff for providing what I thought was quite valuable, the, the thick appendix one that was supplied with the last meeting. It, uh, it, I've, I found it very valuable, like I said, and I used it mainly when, it, when I was providing my feedback to Matthew about the service delivery review, all of the different uh, potential opportunities that Ted just mentioned. And uh, it's when, when it comes from the staff, it, it's even more supported, right? It's, it's many, many things that we have already talked about around the table, but uh, I wanted to thank them for that and thank Matthew. He followed up with my feedback with it, with a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with me, which I, I uh, appreciated. So thank you, Ted, for the, the presentation again tonight. And uh, it is really quite potentially exciting what we could do with it, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Jansman. Uh, other comments, questions? Uh, 
seeing nothing from anyone else. I just wanted a quick comment myself just on the implementation, uh, just so I'm clear on, on, on how this is going to be implemented. So essentially looking at sort of two streams here where one is uh, where the CAO look, uh, leads the process to review position descriptions, remove duplications of tasks, clarify responsibilities and so forth back in that, uh, I think that's page 76 of the, of the package. Uh, so that that would be the one the one stream and looking at things internally, and then the other is the uh, the implementation uh, of the joint collaborative initiative task force. And the, the one thing I would suggest there, but I just don't think there's any way we can do it right now, uh, given COVID, is uh, we did have uh, we have had joint meetings with uh, uh, the full councils, Augusta and Prescott, in the past. And to me, uh, this would be an ideal time to start this and and set up the the actual task force after that that meeting with all of us but it's it, it's absolutely impossible right now i would say uh simply due to, due to covid that it'd be nice to get everyone together in a room but that that's just not going to happen anytime soon so I, I mean i'm looking forward to to how we uh we set up that collaborative task force because i think the one thing here i mean a lot of this we have looked at before obviously with our own internal service delivery but the real opportunity to me lies in what we can do with augusta and uh, that's that's to me is what's uh, quite a, quite exciting there with that uh, that joint task force. So uh, I, I don't know, Ted, if there's I, I didn't see any recommendations, although maybe maybe I missed it on the actual formation of that group. I guess we'd have to talk to Augustine. We don't have to come to any decisions tonight on how many uh, people actually make up uh, comprise that group. But uh, that that to me is where where a lot of the new stuff is going to come from here, and why uh, why this is such a uh, such a, a good pros, uh, project to, to, to go through. It does it does open up uh, added uh, opportunities with uh, with uh, joint uh, joint work between our two municipalities, and that's what to me that's what this is all really about. That's what, what the other stuff's valuable, but this is this is the you know this is the goal to me. Uh, any other comments on uh, on the opportunities and uh, anything that's been 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 tackled so far this evening? Seeing none, so I'll turn it back over, uh, Mr. Darby and Mr. Armstrong. Uh, where are we going from here tonight? So I think uh, from my perspective, what we would do is uh, bring back the full report uh, for next council for adoption, uh, as well as what we can do in terms of an implementation plan. I quite like the idea of having uh, both councils uh, you know, together to discuss uh, once Augusta's in the same place and uh, that will quite possibly be early November and maybe just having a special meeting where we could just dedicate that um, perhaps over Zoom. There's only five members of Augusta Council and, uh, and that sort of thing, but I think it would be great if we could step it off on the right foot. So that certainly is uh, something that we would look at. Also bringing back um, my analysis of uh, kind of the, the overall structure, uh, bringing that back to council as well in November is uh, important to get us uh, set up for uh, next year's budget moving forward. And so those are some of the things that, uh, that I would see that we could uh, definitely do in the shorter term. We'd like to have formal adoption of the report um, at the next meeting and then uh, a bit of an implementation plan along with it. Uh, the only, uh... Uh, if we do the the joint meeting, I would if there's any way we could actually do this in person. I know it's you know there there's still a you know there'll be a number of people in the room. You include staff, your your 15, 16 minimum, I would say in the room. But if we could get a you know a larger space and and perhaps you know there's there's got to be a way we could do this social social distances. To me, there's a real value of getting together in person here if if it is doable. Uh, just it's it just it's a statement, and it, 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 I, I think the meeting in person uh, will facilitate greater communication. The Zoom meetings are great for uh, for us. Uh, we're you know for better or for worse, we all know each other well, and we can communicate fairly well here. But when we're looking at reaching across to another municipality, it would be it would be really nice if uh, if they agree to it, of course, as well. If there's a way we could do something in person, so maybe there's a way we can use a larger room and do do something even even during the pandemic, but. We'll, we'll have time to look at that anyways. So one thing that uh, to just think about, and uh, I'm sure everyone's just uh, wanting to put their hand up, but uh, members that might be interested in being on the joint uh, uh, committee, that'd be fantastic. And we would only be looking for one or two because Augusta only has five members. So as soon as they put three members in a room, then it's a meeting. So 
um, that's why we would only look for one or two and uh, be able to go from there. But just something to think about. Yeah, I'd definitely be interested as as the mayor, and I know uh, Mayor Malenka is as well. So, yeah, something something reasonably uh, tight. That's why I do like the idea of having the meetings with the full councils because good things happen when we do uh, we do meet together like that. And we uh, we haven't had enough of those meetings in recent years with Augusta. We started off strong with that, and it just it sort of drifted. No 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 reason for it. We're obviously still working well together, but it, it's still nice to get everybody together like that on occasion. So anything further this evening, uh, Ted, any, uh, any closing words of wisdom here, uh, or are we good to, to move along and uh, push this to the next meeting for final adoption and an implementation plan? No, I, the only thing I'll say is that it's been of a challenge to, it's been a bit of a challenge to do this report because you're really doing, um, things, uh, the right things in the right way. So <laughs> it's been a bit of a challenge to just try to find, um, much to talk about, but, uh, Anyway, it's been uh, it's been a pleasure and a delight, and I look forward to uh, providing you with the final report. Great. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mr. Darby. So, if there are no further comments, uh, we'll move along this evening, and uh, Matthew. So, we'll get that on the, the next agenda uh, and look at the implementation and uh, adopting the final wording of the uh, of the uh, the report. Where is Augusta, by the way, in this process? You mentioned they weren't quite at the same level as we are. They haven't had the same reports, or. So I think uh, they'll be doing this evening session uh, next Monday, uh, is my understanding. And then we'll both be aligned either the first or second week in November. Okay, good. So we're close then. We're not, yeah. we're not, not off one. That's excellent. Okay, well, thanks very much again, Mr. Darby, for your report tonight and all this information, exciting stuff. And uh, we'll bring it back in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Uh, so on to 12.2, that's staff report 71, 2020, sidewalk, snowplow, tender results. Uh, the recommendation is that council approve the selection of Joe Johnson equipment and the 2020 MT7 trackless machine and attachments with an upset limit of $185,000, including attachments and trade-ins. Uh, do I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor McConnell, seconded by Councillor Burton. And with that, I'll turn it over to, I believe, Nathan, you're handling this this evening? Did I read that right? Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, I put the report together uh, in conjunction with Matthew. He had started the tender uh, process before I joined. Um, but yeah, so there were three tenders and proposals that came in. Um, two of them were kind of in the ballpark of each other. The other one, the pricing was uh, quite a bit more, it's like 25% more than the others and didn't really show a whole lot of equipment uh, improvements or you know things that or over and above the other ones. Um, so we kind of knocked it out. And uh, from the other two, um, the Joe Johnson equipment one was, um, you know, after we talked with staff a little bit as well, um, as far as uh, what machine that they would prefer. And uh, and they were quite excited about the one with the track list from Joe Johnson, as they could, uh, you know, look at other attachments as well within the budget that we have uh, to add on to it to, you know, make the machine that much more uh, effective for the town. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Matt, anything to add to that? Uh, we were pleasantly surprised. Um, the prices have come down a little bit uh, since we've last purchased one, so that was good. And it allows us to uh, take a look at a couple of more attachments that um, we were going to have to replace in the next uh, a year or two um, that we have with our other track list. So it, uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, be able to uh, not only uh, replace uh, the piece of equipment that's currently 16 years old uh, with something that's newer and, uh, and a little bit more uh, advanced in, in how it performs, uh, but also at the same time be able to uh, get a couple of um, attachments within the, the same budget portfolio. So uh, that we were, we were quite happy and pleased with. And uh, ultimately, I think it will be uh, a, a good choice. Uh, one thing that uh, we did have follow up from uh, Councillor McConnell uh, noted that they do have a uh, a shaver for sidewalks uh, for being able to do concrete, uh, as well as uh, infrared um, heater for doing uh, pothole repairs. So those are two uh, pieces of equipment that we would like to evaluate and. Uh, come back to council as part of the 2021 budget if uh, those are going to uh, be something that would solve uh, kind of further costs that uh, that we could avoid 
going forward. We did get initial pricing on both of those, but we would like to better understand exactly how many municipalities are using it and how they use them. So uh, keep uh, keep your uh, eyes peeled for that as uh, we report back uh, on those. But certainly uh, the fact that all of the, the attachments that we currently have can be switched between our two current uh, machines. Um, the new one, is, as well as the uh, the least old one that we have. And then also at the same opportunity, we're going to be trading in the 2004 model uh, to uh, try and reduce the, the cost of this one as well. Hey, sounds good. Uh, any uh, further comments from my uh, council this evening? Councilor Young. So this basically is the same model as the one we bought, what? five or six years ago? Uh, actually, it's one uh, version newer. Uh, so has a little bit more electronics built into it, has a backup camera. Um, th this particular one we're suggesting actually would have a load um, a ride control so that it would automatically adjust for the weight of the uh, implement that's on the front or back of it. And so you wouldn't have as much bouncing and things like that. So there's a couple of improvements and it is one evolution newer. So. Uh, the one that we're replacing is MT5. The one that we uh, purchased a couple of years ago is an MT6, and this is an MT7. Okay, and Joe Johnson, we've dealt with them before, haven't we? Same, yes, we have. Same. Yeah, good. All right, so my only question is, why are we um, setting an upside limit of 185 when we're looking at 137 plus tax? Uh, because we would like to be able to purchase uh, a ribbon snowblower. So several years ago, a snowblower was purchased. It was far too large for the machine and uh, caused it to, to tip. So it hasn't been used. Uh, the other snowblower that we have for our, uh, the models that we're currently using um, is getting towards of its uh, end of its useful life. So we would be able, like to be able to take the difference between the 136 and the 185 to purchase a couple of uh, accessories to be able to um, avoid having to, to replace them uh, in the fairly near future. Uh, oh, there's also with this one, um, there's a, a new implement that they have to be able to do uh, weed control. And so it's a sprayer module that uh, is on the back. So um, we would be able to do some of our own uh, weed control and things like that. So just a couple of uh, lower dollar attachment prices, um, but being able to use them on both machines. Great. A sidewalk snowblower is extremely important, um, I think. So even Sorry. if we could... could uh, so we don't have one at the moment for the other track list? Uh, we do. It's at the end of its useful life. So we, we have two snowblowers, one that's uh, far larger than uh, the track list can handle. And so we're looking at trading that in as well. And then the second one is nearing its end of its useful life. It's got about a year or two left. And so we'd like to take the opportunity to uh, replace it as part of this, uh, this purchase. Okay. And purchase two new ones? Uh, generally, we only need one at a time. Um, so one would be doing snow blowing, the other one would be doing um, sidewalk clearing and sanding. So uh, just being able to, to have that. If it's not that expensive, I'm sure it is expensive, but um, those major storms, it takes a long, long time to get the sidewalks cleared with, without, without a snow blower, as we've seen in the past when the snow blower breaks down. Anyway, good. I'm fine with it. Thank you very much, Councillor Young, uh, Councillor Shankar, then Councillor Jansman, please. And Councillor McConnell, boy, it's, it's snowplow we got a big discussion about tonight. Dory, please. Uh, thank you. Matt, so you're talking about having two machines. I thought we were trading in the 2004. Yep. So we currently have two machines. One's a 2004 and the other one, I believe, is a 20, uh, early in the 2010s. And so we'd be getting rid of the 2004 and bringing in a 2020 model. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jansman, please. Thank you. I just wanted to um, draw attention, if you will, to um, since our new procedural bylaw, the environmental implication is now being used on our staff reports. So I just want to um, draw attention to it and to thank Nathan for, for uh, putting it to use. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Jansman. Councillor McConnell. 
Thank you, Mayor Todd. Size-wise, Matthew, are we looking at the same size as the one we are not replacing? In other words, the newest of the ones that we have now, width-wise and length-wise with the snowblower or the plow on, are we, are we the same size? Yes, essentially, it, uh, they've kept the cabs fairly similar in the overall dimensions. It's improvements in uh, the uh, guts of the machine that they've mostly been focusing on. Thank you. What I was thinking of was the number of ramps that we seem to have in the main street, and it doesn't look like they're going to get any fewer as time goes on. So it, it, maneuverability and size of the machine, of course, uh, becomes important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor McConnell. Any final words? Uh, seeing done, we do have a motion on the floor. Uh, all in favor? Motion's carried. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so 12.3 is staff report 72-2020 uh, on the computer controller uh, for the snowplow truck. Recommendation is that council approve the purchase of a computer controller for the 2010 snowplow from Gincor with an upset limit of $15,860 plus, plus HST. Uh, can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Burton. Uh, Mr. Richards, all yours again. Um, okay, so this, um, the snowplow that was purchased uh, um, last year, it has a computer controller on it to adjust the ratio of sand and salt. And um, the existing snowplow does not have that, and it's a manual control. So it's very subject to operator uh, you know, preference and, and all the variables with the snow conditions. Um, and so uh, what the guys suggested was that there was a, another controller that's exactly the same as on the uh, new plow, put on the old plow, so that um, there's you know, consistent uh, dispersage of the, uh, the salt and the sand uh, between the two machines. Um, and there's some advantages where we you know, should, should see a cost savings over a couple of years um, that you'll you know, you make sure that you're not adjusting, uh, getting as much salt going out as, uh, as maybe that's happening on the current machine. And, um, and also, you know, saving it from going to the environment as well. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan. Uh, open it up for uh, comments, questions. Uh, Councilor McConnell. I think the point was made that uh, if we limit the amount of salt going out and sand going out, which this may very well do on corners and things, it also means that it's that much less that we have to suck out of our sewers in the spring and the summer. So there's a cost saving there as well. I believe there was some messaging from the province once upon a time that this was all going to be mandatory anyways. Computer controlled systems rather than uh, rather than any kind of user uh, user system. I don't know if they've never, I don't think they've ever actually gone through with that unless I, I, I missed something, but uh, I, I know that was, was a discussion once upon a time a few years ago. Matt, do you remember that? Yeah, they, I think they were working on that and then uh, they didn't uh, make a complete decision around it. And one thing that I wanted to point out, there was some concern about having computers and trucks and, and their longevity. But when you take a look at the actual module, it, it's not what you would call a traditional computer. So it's very much electronically controlled and made for the fact that you're gonna be dealing with a, a large truck in, in that environment. So it, uh, we like the fact that they uh, match both uh, one between the trucks. And uh, I th believe that will give us a much better uh, spread of the material um, as we kind of move forward and, and try to find the most efficient way of, of getting material down and in the right mixture. Sounds good. Uh, any uh, final uh, comments? Uh, seeing that, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. And moving right along, we're at 12.4. That's uh, staff report 73-2020, uh, draft water and wastewater agreement between Augusta and Prescott for the development of uh, 1688 King Street West in the township of Augusta. Uh, the recommendation is that council agree in principle to the draft water and wastewater agreement between Augusta and Prescott, and that the agreement be, bought, be brought back to council for final review after being uh, reviewed and approved uh, by the township of Augusta. Uh, can I have a mover, please? 
moved by Councilor Ostrander, seconded by Councilor Young. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, can you uh, take us through the report? And this is something that's been before us in the past, but it's been, uh, I think it's been quite some time now. So it's it's almost a brand, brand new item in many ways. So please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So just as a point of clarification, I think in 12.4 on the agenda, it said 1688, but it's actually 1686 uh, King Street West. So apology for the uh, uh, error on that. But you're exactly right. I think uh, when we started looking back in the files, this started back in uh, 2015 or 2016. And really the piece of property we're talking about is just on our border. Um, it's called Augusta Landings. And uh, just as you are heading west out of town on King Street, uh, you go down the, the little hill and it's the uh, large abandoned house on the, the, the north side of the road. So uh, what's being proposed is a 20 unit um, condominium uh, development um, and it's in uh, the township of Augusta. They would like to be able to attach to our water and sewer uh, off of Henry Street. So back in 2014, uh, there was a bylaw passed. It was 12, 2014. And it was to establish water and sewer unit calculations and associated fees. With that, it uh, did envision being able to provide uh, water and sewer um, outside of our boundaries and specifically uh, for, for this particular development. So um, this development, I think, is ranged anywhere from 40 some units down to the 20 that you see today. And with the 20 units, there's also a one uh, approximately 1,000 square foot community building uh, for it. So the, we just go through the calculations, taking a look at bylaw um, 12, 2014, multiply that through by the number of units and then the loading factor, which was 0.85 and uh, no uh, development uh, or unit would have less than 0.85. And so we see that fitting within that. And then um, it results in a, a one-time payment from Augusta to the town of Prescott of $181,689. So uh, that would go directly into reserves, uh, both from a water and uh, wastewater perspective and be able to uh, provide uh, additional breakdown there. And in the bylaw uh, 12, 2014, it does highlight exactly um, where that would be uh, specified into which reserves. So again, this agreement is only for 1686 King, King Street West. It does not um, preclude or necessarily guarantee any further um, uh, water and wastewater uh, connections, uh, but certainly it, it addresses this one particular property. And uh, I think, you know, largely it's based on the agreement uh, in draft that was developed in 2016 and then uh, updated for some of today's uh, rates and, and whatnot. So we're very pleased to bring this uh, forward. Tonight, we're just asking for agreement in principle. Uh, it would be brought forward to uh, Augusta uh, Council, I believe next week um, for contemplation. And then if both sides agree, then it would come back for approval at the next meeting on November 2nd of our council meeting. So uh, it's one of the things that they need to be able to uh, put in place before moving ahead with the development. And we are uh, happy to say that they have already gone through the uh, minor variants and zoning uh, reclassifications in Augusta. Uh, they've been uh, passed by uh, Township of Augusta and to date, I don't believe there's been any appeal on those. So their next step is to do site plan control. And one of the things in site plan control is making sure they address the water and wastewater um, uh, servicing for that lot. So that's why we're bringing it forward this evening and uh, more than happy to answer any questions that might, uh, might be uh, in everyone's mind. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll note before we open up for discussion, this, a lot of this really does go back to the, uh, uh, the negotiations with Edwardsburg Cardinal and the sewer deal uh, back in, uh, in 2014. We did set formulas there for uh, the sale of other, uh, other excess capacity. And then that, of course, was augmented by the uh, water deal, uh, which was signed with the uh, Edwardsburg Cardinal a little later on. Uh, so the numbers are all pretty much carved in stone for in, in terms of uh, how they're applied. But uh, just, just to give people a little bit of history here, because it does go back, uh, hard to believe it's been six years now since that uh, that deal was signed, but it's uh, it's been some time. So I see Councillor Young had his uh, had his hand up. Uh, I'll open up for discussion. 
Thank you, Mayor Todd. I just wanted to point out to the public, the other thing is that we are not responsible for any costs um, involving sewer lines and water lines and digging and uh, attachments to houses. That's, that's all in the ballpark of Augusta to work out with the developer. Uh, so the, the money that we're receiving is uh, simply for access to our facilities that will go towards our capital costs eventually. Uh, the other question I had, Matthew, is I assume that this would include hydrants uh, for fire suppression? That is correct. I believe there's a requirement for two fire hydrants on the uh, site plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Young. Uh, further comments? Uh, Councillor McConnell. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Um, as we all know, Henry Street was just repaved this last uh, summer, and that is where we want to hook up, or at least where the developer uh, is wanting to hook up to our sewer system. And I presume that uh, the west end of that new pavement is going to have to be dug into. Uh, in addition to that, the sidewalks on Henry Street are, well, they're in very poor condition. I'm sure they must be somewhere high on the list of, of replacement sidewalks uh, in town. Uh, there is supposed to be a walking connection from this development onto Henry Street. And I guess what I would want to ensure is that the new pavement that we have and the reconstruction on the west end of Henry Street uh, when it is hooked into and excavated, wherever it has to be done is going to be put back in the condition that it is now. And it is going to be done at no cost to our taxpayers. It's going to be done by either Augusta Township or the developer of this property. Uh, and in addition, as far as the walking paths go, we're just uh, opening ourselves up for liability unless we do something with at least one of the sidewalks uh, on that block of, of Henry Street. Uh, and we would have to do it in time for the occupation, I think, of the uh, condominiums on the adjacent property. One other thing that I would like to just put forward, and it has nothing to do with water, but it seems to me to be an opportune time to, to mention it. We've had a variety of studies, a variety of plans in town and they all suggest uh, walking and bicycle paths. We have no place that we can put a bicycle or walking path up the west end of Prescott, but I'm wondering if we can speak to Augusta Township and the developer and then their site control um, provide a space where at some future point, a walking path can be developed up which up would be the east side of this property as far as it goes. So those, those three things uh, I just wanted to throw in there. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor McConnell. Yeah, and, and what we've got here tonight is just the servicing agreement, but it's, they're excellent questions. And then you know the point about uh, how these things would be addressed when it comes to site plan approval and everything else, because it really does uh, cross a border there. So I'm not sure how exactly that that would be handled because it does tie into a lot of what Councillor McConnell uh, asked those very good questions about. Matthew, how what, what's the process and procedure for something like this that crosses boundaries? Certainly. So there's a site plan control application that's currently out for comment and questions. So the uh, absolutely the points that were made this evening, I'll bring up with uh, and provide feedback uh, no later than October 27th. And so um, I will have a direct conversation as well with the uh, with Augusta to make sure that our points are uh, well understood and uh, we can make sure that those things are included in site plan control. Thank you very much. Uh, any follow up, uh, Councillor McConnell? No, no. Uh, I just want to express the concerns and uh, see where they go uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any further uh, comments tonight? Uh, Councillor Young. Um, the writing on the diagram uh, showing the layout is, is a little small for my ancient eyes. So I'm 
I'm seeking help here. Um, if we turn the turn the diagram 25 degrees, or one quarter turn, we're, we're now looking at the long driveway on the left of the drawing will be the only entrance to the property. And that will be off of Highway 2, correct, Matthew? That is correct, yes. Okay, and so the buildings, it looks to me like there's one, two, three, and then one, two. So that's five and four units in each one. Uh, so there's, it, these are stacked uh, townhouse, right. townhouses or condominiums. And so uh, basically the one that's furthest to the east will have uh, eight units. And so four on the bottom, four on the top. Right. And then the one to the west will have 12 units. So six in the bottom, six on the top. The Good. buildings that you see behind are actually garages. Garage, yeah. Okay, good. And a uh, community building, where was that? Um, that's directly farthest uh, north is there's a, a clubhouse or community building um, okay. north on the property. Super, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Young. Any other comments? Uh, seeing none, I'll return to the motion then and uh, call for the vote. All those in favor? Motion is carried. So Mr. Armstrong, this goes now goes back to Augusta. You'll communicate uh, the concerns I relayed here as well. When uh, do you think this will be back before us? Um, if everything uh, goes well, then I would expect that our um, we would have it back for November 2nd and uh, be able to uh, hopefully formally pass it. In terms of the site plan control, I will uh, definitely uh, convey those concerns and uh, that will, it's a more uh, formal process uh, that they'll go through, but, uh, but we will certainly participate in that. Excellent. It's a great development uh, for, for both of us. And I understand that the, the developer uh, is Mr. Tom, like Rob Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson is looking at uh, breaking ground in the, the not too distant future, I understand as well. There's a, a fairly aggressive timeline now for the bill. Yep. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I believe uh, their next step is to site plan control. So as soon as that's uh, done and underway, this is one of the things that they need in order to uh, to be able to move the site plan control forward. And so it, uh, it's important for us to, to keep our moving along and uh, they'd be able to start when the, when the, it suits them. Uh, certainly. Uh, Councillor McConnell, did you have another question? Just uh, something that occurred to me, the house, uh, the old uh, mansion house or Alpine Lodge, whatever you want to call it, is a very historic house in this area. And I'm wondering before it's dropped, whether the uh, Historic Society would have the opportunity to just take a walk through and see if there's anything there of interest that they could uh, that they could uh, cabbage, so to speak, before it's gone. More than happy to pass that along. It, uh, I have noticed that um, it has been open to the elements for, for quite a while now, but certainly more than happy to, uh, to see it and try to arrange that. And I think Rob has a plan for the use of the stone and another development in uh, maybe Kempville, but I, I think there is a plan to repurpose it. So at least it will be uh, reutilized somewhere, which has happened before, of course. That's how we got the stone from uh, uh, locally uh, for those uh, the Prescott signs that went in about 17, 18 years ago. So thanks, everyone. And we do have one more uh, item under uh, staff reports uh, this evening. That's a 12.5. Uh, staff report 74-2020 uh, uh, lease of 202 King Street West uh, for museum and complimentary uses. Uh, the recommendation reads that council authorize the mayor and clerk to enter into a lease agreement for a term of five years for 202 King Street West for $2,000 plus HST per month inclusive of utilities plus a yearly consumer price index increase following the first year to provide space for a Prescott museum and complimentary uses. Would someone be willing to make that motion? Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Ostrander. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, if you could please take us into your report. Certainly, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So uh, coming out of the last meeting, there was a few concerns uh, that uh, I believe Council wanted addressed. And so we walked through each of those with the um, property owner to determine what the best path forward was. So what we thought would be a good idea is because this is a building in our downtown core and we do have community improvement plan 
um, set up for that area that we there could be a cost sharing uh, through the CIP grant. So for the accessibility uh, upgrades for the front door and specifically the ramp, um, there's uh, part of that CIP program is up to $5,000 grant in matching funds. So a total uh, project of up to $10,000 uh, could be covered through that. Facade upgrades, so uh, there again, uh, the front door uh, needs to be replaced. And uh, we do have a $5,000 matching grant for facade uh, upgrades, which the door will qualify for. Finally, uh, commercial upgrades um, does include HVAC, air conditioning, that sort of thing. And so uh, a grant could be applied for for 50% of the uh, matching costs up to $6,000 or $3,000 grant amount. And then we have the building permit. So we thought this was a great opportunity to, uh, to use the CIP. Um, not only from that building perspective, but also just from the overall downtown to be able to provide even after, um, you know, if the town does move out after uh, the term of the lease or in the future, that those types of things would be covered through the, the CIP and be benefit to, to the next uh, tenant. When we took a look at the uh, back room and uh, the back area, uh, that's something that um, we would like to be able to uh, do ourselves actually, in terms of the uh, renovations and it's estimated to cost 10 to $15,000, uh, but being able to provide the accessible washroom as well as um, taking a look at being able to create a storage area for some of the artifacts aren't um, going to lend themselves well to being out on display and some of them are paper uh, based. And so wanting to make sure that we preserve those properly. And then we also believe we could create a meeting room back there as well. So um, this is gonna be a little bit more um, to our needs. And so that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, we would be able to, uh, to cover it out of our total reserves. Um, in terms of the uh, being responsible for the security system, so we would uh, install a security system as well as camera and anytime the security system went off, it would go directly to the police to be able to respond. Um, so uh, there again, uh, because it's a very specific uh, need for us, then uh, we would pay for, uh, for that uh, upgrade. And then the property owner is firm on a five year uh, commitment uh, for the lease and so uh, that was uh, the, the final answer on that. And so bringing that forward. So I believe that covers um, kind of the accessibility issues uh, at the front of the building. It covers the HVAC dehumidification uh, issues with the building itself, covers any renovations in the back as well as security and the term of the lease. Um, one of the, the paramount things that, that we need to consider at this point is being able to move the collection prior to November 30th of 2020. Um, we have uh, reached out to a couple of an antique movers. Um, they're estimating somewhere in the neighborhood of $10,000 to be able to package up the uh, collection appropriately, move it, and uh, certainly we would take every opportunity to reduce that cost as well. So the renovations to the building, um, I think between the uh, landlord as well as us, we would work it through them throughout the winter and spring and aim for a, an opening at Victoria Day. Um, to be able to prepare ourselves for the tourist season for 2021. Um, at the same time, from a financial implication standpoint, we do have about $80,000 in the museum reserve, plus the proceeds of 201 Water Street West. So coming from that will be the cost to move the artifacts, the renovations to the back area of 202 King Street West, purchasing and installing the security system, and finally uh, purchasing display cabinets and the setup for the museum artifacts for the uh, viewing area. So uh, from, the, from a, the cost, for an operating cost, currently we put $30,000 uh, towards the museum every year, 20,000 that goes into reserve, 10,000 that's used for operating. Uh, that whole amount could be uh, reallocated for operating the museum, uh, which would cover the uh, rent, uh, uh, telephone, internet, things like that. And so overall, we would not be um, any having to uh, provide any further funding uh, towards that. So those were uh, the items that I heard coming out of last meeting that uh, that needed to be addressed. And, uh, and we did our best to be able to uh, attack each of them and uh, come up with a resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Open it up for a discussion with members of council. Have at it, folks. Uh, Councilor Burton, please. 
Thank you. I just wanted to thank uh, Matthew for um, answering all my questions over the last couple of days. Um, I did uh, ask a few about uh, renovations and the cost and uh, it just puts my mind at ease that we're, they're, we're making a, the right decision to put the museum in the location that is recommended by staff. So I appreciate um, them getting back to me on the timely matter. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Burton. Other comments, questions? Councillor McConnell, please. Uh, Matthew mentioned that the SIP grant would be used uh, and part for this, part for that. Um, I'm presuming then that uh, the landlord is responsible for the rest of those renovations and not the town? That's correct. So anything under the CIP grant would uh, the um, landlord has uh, agreed that they would uh, bore the cost of the other half of those uh, co uh, upgrades. And the leak in the roof? Uh, so it appeared to be an older leak when uh, we went and uh, looked at it. Uh, more than happy, the landlord was more than happy to uh, have written into the lease that any uh, leaking from above would be uh, dealt with in a quick and timely manner. And um, that uh, when we do the renovations in the back area, um, they're fairly minor in terms of just being able to, um, because likely we're gonna provide a little bit of a drop ceiling, uh, which will address the uh, ceiling issue. And we're replacing the floor with probably uh, an inexpensive vinyl flooring. And so that will deal with the uh, flooring issue. Thank you. Uh, one more, if I may, Mayor Todd. Uh, it was mentioned that we might possibly be able to co-share part of that with uh, either the BIA or the chamber, and there would be some money coming in from them for shared rent, what have you. Uh, where are we with that? Uh, is, is it anticipated that that's going to happen? Maybe not so much with the chamber, but with the BIA, who has been kind of trying to go down that road for a while anyway? So I think the BIA, uh, if I may speak um, on behalf of uh, Councillor Jasmine and, and Mayor Todd, but they're very much wanting to still pursue that concept. So um, either by themselves or with a partner in the chamber, but um, I think very much uh, we see that as being a great fit um, and being able to, that way we don't have to separately staff it, uh, being able to create a little bit of a uh, visitor center um, for the, the times when BIA perhaps isn't there. And uh, we feel we can uh, definitely be able to do that. I think what they're trying to do is regroup um, in terms of what exactly they want a coordinator to do. They had it kind of figured out if they were sharing, now they're trying to figure out what would happen if um, it's just them and uh, being able to support that. And that's one of the things that I'm also trying to work into uh, when we talked earlier about, you know, what does the structure of uh, the town of Prescott look like, you know, is there an opportunity where we can uh, work with them and be able to address uh, the operating the museum as well. So uh, there was a couple of things in there. That, and I, as I mentioned, I, they're very much still wanting to, uh, to work in that vein. And uh, I think this would be a, an excellent opportunity to be able to do that. Very good. Um, one more thing just occurred to me if I can. Sure. Um, in the information package that we got uh, for tonight's meeting, the monthly publication by the Historical Society was in there, and I don't know if anybody else read it or not, but I found it quite interesting. There was a portion on the museum when it first opened, that is the museum building that we're currently operating, and you, you probably know what I'm talking about, uh, assuming you've read it. Um, it actually sounded like the museum was a real going concern in those days. It had a lot of participation from different uh, groups, uh, historical society in particular. It had donations that rotated through. Um, um, I would hope that if the town provides this larger space for a museum, for an access, um, an accessible large space, that that interest from the public will return and we will have volunteers down there again that can help rotate and provide interesting displays 
that will bring the town in that we haven't had in, in a few years. And I'll shut up right there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor McConnell. Uh, Matt, did you have a response to that? Absolutely. And so that's very much, um, I, I think, as we've gone through this conversation, that we really want to activate um, that space. And so being able to partner with other museums to bring in uh, perhaps traveling uh, artifacts and things like that, uh, partnering with our friends at the fort, uh, being able to perhaps uh, work through their um, uh, larger network across all of Canada, I think is a great opportunity. So with that becomes uh, incumbent upon uh, the, the town to really figure out how we're going to put some resources behind this and, and make it into something that we can be really proud of. So that uh, this is a kind of our first step. And, and as we move in that direction, then uh, that is our ultimate goal. So when we talked a little bit earlier about um, with, with Ted and, and having a project management kind of concept, I think our next step is to say, okay, what do we want out of the museum? And then state those goals and then start to be able to work towards them. And we have about a six or seven month period before um, you know, we open it to the public and get moving. And so what does our first phase look like? And then how do we expand it after that? Uh, Councillor Young, did I see your hand up a moment ago? I, yes, Mayor Todd, I was just going to add that um, back in the 80s, I was involved with the museum board and the key to our museum and the activities then was a curator. Uh, you all remember Mrs. DeVries uh, looked after it for a number of years and um, she was the one who would organize the events down there. So uh, I guess for next steps on this, uh, Matthew, if we could have uh, an update back uh, to before us in November, just, I mean, there's, there's, there are a lot of particulars here with uh, regards to the moving, uh, the collection of artifacts and so forth. We have been working with uh, Fraser Lassinger, of course, and Fraser is uh, uh, very supportive of this move as well. So I think and everybody around the council table has been very uh, positive about his involvement because he's someone that is quite knowledgeable and also really cares about uh, uh, Prescott history and heritage. So I think we've got somebody really good there and uh, that uh, can, can really help us out here. So uh, after tonight, if we could just have an update on where we are before the end of November and just uh, review where, we at, where we're at with the collection of artifacts and uh, maybe, even, uh, maybe even we need a presentation from Fraser on some of this at, uh, at some point. Uh, before the end of the year, I would suggest doesn't have to be immediate, uh, but I'd love to get his take on it. He hasn't been in to speak to us uh, uh, directly on this, and uh, I think uh, it's time to bring him in. We've had you and I, of course, have had a number of discussions with him uh, going over the last few months, so uh, we're in a good spot here now. I think if this is approved tonight, and it seems like it will be, and it, uh, I hope that uh, with regards to the volunteers and maybe reestablishing a uh, a museum board, uh, you know, something uh, akin to what we had in the 80s when there was more activity with the museum. That's the ideal goal. We did get some uh, publicity on this. And there were some people that, of course, spoke out pretty strongly about their connection with the Forders Museum. And I, I hope that continues uh, with regards to just the establishment of a Prescott Museum overall, because we could really use some some good volunteers coming out to support the uh, Historical Soci Society and to support our new museum. Uh, because uh, as, as with many things, uh, we're going to succeed or fail here uh, based on what the volunteer support is and what the community uh, wants and uh, would like us to do down there. So hopefully this is just the start of a great process where we uh, uh, really look at how we're going to establish staff and operate this, uh, this new museum over the winter months so we can have a great opening in, uh, in May. But uh, uh, good stuff. And uh, with that, I think if anyone else has any final comments... Uh, seeing none, so I will call the uh, the vote. All in favor? Motion is approved. Thanks, everyone. So that takes us uh, through staff reports. Item 13 is resolutions. No resolutions this evening. Uh, 14 is bylaws. We do have one bylaw that's uh, under 14.1, uh, snowplow debenture bylaw. The recommendation reads that bylaw 44-2020 being a bylaw to approve the submission of an application to Ontario Infrastructure and Lands Corporation, OILC, for the long-term financing of certain capital works of the Corporation of the Town of Prescott. 
uh, in parentheses, the municipality, and to authorize entering into of a rate offer letter agreement uh, pursuant to which the municipality will issue debentures to OILC, be read and passed, signed by the mayor and clerk, and sealed by the seal of the corporation. Do I have a, a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Young, seconded by Councilor Ostrander. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, quick comment on that. Sure. So this is um, allowing for moving forward with the debenture for the snow plow that we purchased uh, that was part of the 2019 uh, capital budget. And so um, it, in order to make sure that it gets in uh, into the 2020 uh, grouping for the province, then uh, bring it forward now. So the total cost of the plow, uh, if you remember, the budget was 300000 and it costs $274,400, inclusive of of the net uh, HST rebate. And so uh, it would be repayable over 10 years, which is approximately half of the life of the uh, snow plow. In the second uh, 10 years, we would actually put the money aside so that uh, when this uh, one uh, needs replacement, that we would have money in the bank to be able to do that. So uh, that's uh, the concept that we've been working on for the last couple of years to be able to start to put money away for our capital uh, investments. And and this is really just, uh, we'll come back another, at least another one time, um, if not twice, to be able to approve the debenture itself. But this is entering into the rate agreement um, as the first step. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Uh, so 15, new business. Any member of council have any new business to present this evening? Seeing no, uh, 16 notices of motion. Any member of council have a notice of motion to present this evening? Also, no, uh, 17 mayor's proclamation. We do have one this evening. So I scroll down to it. We did receive this just a little, uh, a little late uh, for October. It came in right after our last meeting, uh, but we're uh, we still gonna, going to do it uh, sort of so backdate into October a little bit. But proclamation reads October 2020, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Uh, whereas the month of October is traditionally used to recognize and celebrate the workplace contributions of people who have a disability, and whereas Canadian businesses can benefit from hiring with a focus on diversity and inclusion, and whereas studies have found that businesses that hire inclusively experience 72% more productivity, 45% increase in workplace safety, 30% higher profit margins, and two times the net income compared to other businesses, and whereas the coronavirus pandemic has significantly affected access to employment for individuals in our community with disabilities, and whereas by increasing awareness of the hidden talent pool of highly educated and skilled people can help our local businesses recover from the pandemic and prepare for the future. Therefore, the Council of the Corporation of the Town of Prescott does hereby proclaim the month of October 2020 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in the Town of Prescott and urges citizens to celebrate the business successes stemming from hiring with a focus on diversity and acknowledge the workplace accomplishment of people with disabilities. And that's, of course, uh, signed uh, this uh, 19th day of October, 2020. And with that, uh, nothing under closed session this evening, nothing under rise and report, of course, as well. So nothing under 18 and 19. 20 is a confirming bylaw from this evening. That's 45 dash 2020 recommendation reads the bylaw 45-2020 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the council meeting held on October 19th, 2020, be read and passed, signed by the mayor and sealed by the seal of the corporation. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor Shankar. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Thanks, everyone. And 21 is our favorite motion, motion for adjournment. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councilor Ostrander, seconded by Councilor Young. Well, that was tough. Come on, folks. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll, I'll call the motion. All in favor? Motion is carried. It is 734. We are adjourned for this evening. Thanks to everyone out there for watching, and uh, we'll be back in uh, two weeks.